thinking today of that beautiful land I shall reach when the sun goeth down When through wonderful grace by my Savior I stand Will there be any stars in my crown? Will there be any stars, any stars? When I wake with the blessed in those mansions of rest, will there be any stars in my crown? In the strength of the Lord, let me labor and pray. Let me watch as a winner of souls, that bright stars may be mine in that glorious day. Should there be any stars in my in those mansions of rest will there be any stars in my crown what a joy it will be when his face I behold living gems at his feet to lay down it would sweeten my bliss in that city of gold should there be any stars in my When I wake with the blessed in those mansions of rest, will there be any stars in my crown? I shall reach when the sun goeth down When through wonderful grace by my Savior I stand Will there be any stars in my crown? Hello, thank you for joining us. My name is Carol Blankenship and I'm chair of the Department of Music and Theater at Rhodes College. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 Springfield Music Lecture. The Springfield Music Lectures program was established at Rhodes through a bequest by the late John Murray Springfield, a member of the class of 1951. The importance of John Murray's bequest to Rhodes is evident in the quality of the lecturers who have visited Rhodes for the Springfield Music Series. Past lecturers include Sir David Wilcox, John Rutter, Libby Larson, Jennifer Higdon, Pamela Z, Christoph Wolf, Morton Lauridson, Alice Parker, Christopher Hogwood, Richard Teruskin, and many more. This week, we are welcoming Caroline Shaw to Rhodes as the Springfield Lecturer. In just a few minutes, my colleague, Dr. Evan Williams, will formally introduce Caroline Shaw. But first, please enjoy Entreact by Caroline Shaw, performed by our friends at the Memphis Symphony Orchestra. Thank you. 
Hello, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Evan Williams, Assistant Professor of Music and Director of Instrumental Activities here at Rhodes College. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our 2021 Springfield Lecturer, Caroline Shaw. But before doing so, I wish to thank several people who made this virtual residency possible. To all of the performers on tonight's program, to Erica Pope and her staff in the music office, Kim Bennett, Director of College Events, to Ethan Van Dremelen, Lyria Hocus, Charlie Kinney, and Elijah Wilkerson in the communications office, to Meg Sippy and Aaron Casty with the Memphis Symphony, to Miss Shaw's representation and assistant, James Egelhofer, and Ben Murphy. And of course, to John Murray Springfield and the Springfield family for their continuous support of the Springfield Lecture Series. The Springfield Lecture Series is devoted to bringing musical thinkers of the highest magnitude to the Rhodes campus to foster an appreciation of music as an academic discipline. We have been honored to host musicologists, theorists, conductors, performers, and composers to present a formal lecture and to engage with our students in the classroom. While circumstances mandated that this year's event be virtual, we have had the pleasure of welcoming Ms. Shaw to several virtual classes, lessons, and rehearsals over the last two days. Our students have been enthralled by Caroline's music and insight. Not only will we get to hear her music and lecture today, but we invite you all to join us for a question and answer session with Caroline at the end of the presentation. To say that Caroline Shaw's career is diverse is an understatement. She is a violinist, singer, composer, and producer. As a member of the vocal ensemble Room Full of Teeth, she won a Grammy for their 2012 self-titled album. As a composer, her landmark piece, Partita for Eight Voices, written for Room Full of Teeth, made her the youngest winner of the Pulitzer Prize in 2013. Pitchfork proclaims that her recent album release with the Ataka String Quartet, Orange, quote, exudes joy and a sense of wildness. Her music can be heard in films like To Keep the Light and Madeline's Madeline, along with the hit series Mozart in the Jungle. Not constrained by the contemporary classical idiom, Caroline has contributed to albums by Nas, Kanye West, The National, and Arcade Fire. There is perhaps no one better to teach us about building a diverse musical career, to perform her music, and to present her lecture, Cultivating a Multifaceted Musical Career. Please welcome Caroline Shaw.
Hello? (laughs) 
I'm just waiting to, to make sure I get a proper signal uh, before I begin. Okay, <laughs> thumbs up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Evan. Hello, everyone. I'm Caroline. Um, it is a pleasure and an honor to be here today with you. Uh, I wish we could all be in the same room, of course, but I'm very grateful for this Zoom room. And I also would like to say that I fully understand the challenges of Zoom. Uh, I have, it has been a year and I haven't quite gotten it right myself. So um, I'm, I'm, thank you everyone for their patience. Um, thank you so much to Evan Williams, Carol Blankenship, Erica Pope, Kim Bennett, and all of the staff and faculty of Rhodes College for inviting me into your world. Thank you, of course, especially to the wonderful players who dedicated their time to come together and perform my music. I was uh, incredibly moved by your beautiful performances, and I'm, I'm honored to have shared uh, this musical space with you. I've spent the past few days with students at Rhodes who are absolutely brimming with curiosity and creativity and mutual support and generosity. I've visited classes of the orchestra, choir, theory, history, and composition, and I've really enjoyed getting to know uh, these wonderful members of the Rhodes community. Lecture might be too strong and specific a word to describe the brief remarks that I'd like to share with you tonight. At first, I thought I might embark on a sort of creative manifesto, uh, but that seemed a little heavy and daunting. Um, and then I thought maybe I'll offer some guiding advice specifically for budding composers and producers, but I am still gathering that experience and wisdom myself, but I'm happy to take questions at the end. So uh, keep them in mind uh, and please bring them forward later. What I realized after the last two days of speaking with these brilliant Rhodes College students um, whose interests include not only music, but math and physics and poetry and astronomy and ecology and the whole gamut, I realized that what I'd actually like to bring to the table this evening is something just a bit outside of music. Uh, I want to share with you a, a short excerpt from an essay by Derek Lynch, who is a professor of agronomy and agroecology at Dalhousie University in Canada. Uh, the essay is called Soil is the Key to Our Planet's History and Future. This is something that uh, I've been living with for about two years now. Uh, I've been working with a dance artist in Vancouver named Vanessa Goodman on a evening length theater dance music theater project called graveyards and gardens which uh, just premiered in january and which we're going to keep uh, evolving and working on as we over the next few years and when we started working together we found ourselves asking uh, what is soil what goes into it how do we honor and take care of it how can we let soil play its simple part in the growth of plants that are part of the wildly complex ecosystem that sustains us? And then going further, what is memory and how does history of a specific land soil, whether literal or metaphorical, affect what grows out of it? And of course, my brain goes to the, the musical metaphors in there. What is musical memory, which is something that I think about quite a lot. Uh, and further, is there a lesson to be understood here about the nature of creative collaboration, of bringing yourself and all that you have to offer into the mix uh, with the ideas and histories and memories of others, of letting go in order to nourish the idea or the piece or the thing that is being created in that collaboration? I have no grand answers or conclusions today, uh, but I thought that maybe I'd share with you uh, this bit of writing from Derek Lynch, which has been seeping into the strange soil of my own creative world for a few years now. So here's the excerpt from Derek Lynch's essay. He writes, what is soil? Soil is the thin layer of material covering the Earth's surface. It is made up mainly of mineral particles, organic materials like plant, animal, and human remains, air, water, and living organisms, all of which interact slowly yet constantly. Soil is the irreplaceable skin of the earth. 
Yet we have so many phrases in the English language that diminish its value and importance, like bogged down or cheap as dirt. Is it just dirt or a cathedral of evolutionary and cultural memory? A repository of memory, much like our bodies hold muscle memory, and our computers have RAM, and the ground is hungry. Soil stores our past, present, and will shape our future. Like a library, soil houses stories written from the microscopic to the immense evolutionary histories. Our impacts from global nitrogen cycles to our use of atomic weapons can be read as elemental and isotopic traces in the soil. One quarter of all the world's biodiversity is found in soil. In many cases, plants and soil microbes establish mutually beneficial relationships, communicating with each other by sending signals through the soil in a complex dating game or an intertwined romance. We need to cherish and learn from soil now more than ever. It holds the keys to our planet's past and future. So that's from the essay, Soil is the Key to Our Planet's History and Future by Derek Lynch, professor of agronomy and agroecology at Dalhousie University. Uh, we've talked a lot about creative process and collaboration over the last two days here. And I found myself uh, coming back to these metaphors that ecology offers us. How do we take care of each other? How do we support each other? How do we respect and honor and remember each other and learn from each other? What are the questions that we are asking in our work? What are the questions that others are asking in theirs? What happens when we let our roots and stems and branches intertwine, fall away, transform, and grow again. Whether our practice is art or science or music, how can we let the soil play its simple part? Thank you so much again to Professor Evan Williams and to the faculty and staff of Rhodes for inviting me to speak tonight and to play and to sing. Um, it may be one of the least musical lectures, bit of lectures about music, but I hope in there there are a few seeds that uh, might take root in some small way someday. Thank you so much. Uh, and now you can ask me anything. I'm open to any and all questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Caroline. What uh, a beautiful uh, set of performances, uh, a beautiful lecture. Uh, what's so great about this lecture series is that it's all about engagement. It's not just, you know, someone talking to us uh, from a podium and then walking away, but engagement um, with our students. And so it's so important to us that you uh, all feel free to ask questions. So. Uh, uh, go into the Q and A um, box on Zoom and enter your questions. Those will be relayed to me, and I will ask them to Caroline. Um, as we wait for those questions to queue up, uh, I'll start with one of my own. Uh, so, gardening is is something. Gardening and soil is something that's a clearly important um, theme for you. I I like that your website. You call your website your own little garden plot on the internet. <laughs> Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about the the soil and the roots and the foundation that make your music. Um, and a lot of your music, I feel a lot of us uh, see both the known, the things that we know and appreciate uh, in the music that we've uh, grown up with, like hymn song and uh, Baroque forms and whatnot. Uh, but then there's a, a bit of the unknown. Um, there's a bit of... Uh, of, of techniques from around the world, uh, what some of us might call extended technique um, in the classical era uh, area. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how, how do you cultivate uh, these traditions that you've grown up with, lived with as a musician, and bring them to this beautiful life in your music? Oh, thank you so much. That's a very uh, generous question, uh, Evan. Um, I, I've i been telling some students that I, I believe in writing from a place of love, and that's a, maybe it's a vague concept, but it, it really means digging into the things that, that um, we ourselves love in terms of finding your own voice. And I, I constantly go back to the things that I grew up with, maybe have moved away from, but still hold a particular place in my heart, certain harmonies or certain words or certain bits of language. And 
I think staying, really cultivating one's um, instincts and patterns and habits um, from that place of, of loving, in my case, music so much is, uh, is all about kind of, again, cultivating one's own soil in order for, mm-hmm. for something to grow. Mm-hmm. I love that. I love that. Uh, so our first c- question comes from um, Andre. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, and they, and that's, this is actually a question that has come up a couple of times with you is, what music do you usually listen to? <laughs> Thanks, Andre. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I should be very honest, when I'm writing music, I, I can't listen to anything else. I sort of, uh, maybe it's just ocean, ocean sounds or silence. I think silence is really powerful. But when I do kind of go into the world of listening, um, lately, I've been I've been talking about the band Tune Yards that I really like, uh, uh, Jane Aronica, who, who performs as Chica, and um, and then I listen to tons of older music. Bach is something that I come back to uh, always. I think he, I really like Bach's music because he he doesn't always write on a grand scale. That he has big things, but he also writes for just single instruments mm-hmm. and for friends, and mm-hmm. I, I find that really inspiring. Awesome. Awesome. Our next question comes from Rachel, and it's sort of a two-parter. So she asks, do you feel like your work overall has been impacted by your, by the success that you had so early on? And then her second part is, do you think it's changed the way people view your work since? Mm. Yeah, I I am very fortunate to have have suddenly um, been kind of known uh, through the Pulitzer Prize. And at, at that point, it was about eight years ago, and I, I hadn't written very much music. And so I didn't quite know what to expect of myself. Um, and no one knew really what to expect, uh, which was, a, there was a great freedom in that. Uh, and I feel really lucky to have had that freedom. And um, I try not to think about what, you know, what the expectations of others are, or, or, or um, what they think. But um, I, I'm I'm mostly just feel grateful and fortunate to have a lot of the opportunities that I, I um, to to write for certain people that I wouldn't otherwise have gotten to write for. Yeah. Uh, so our next question is uh, actually concerning Partita, uh, and of mm-hmm. course, recently a little bit of uh, controversy that surrounded it. So uh, they ask, how was it dealing with this cultural controversy surrounding Partita? And how did you make the decision to uh, make the changes to the piece that you are con- that you are working on now? Because it's very rare, obviously, the, a Pulitzer Prize winning piece, that uh, a, a Grammy Award winning piece that we hear on albums. H- how did you decide to make the very hard choice to, to, to no longer perform that version and to make the changes to the third movement? Oh, sure. It, you know, it wasn't a hard choice. It was very, very clear as soon as um, uh, there's a there's a part of Partita that is very deeply rooted in a uh, tradition of Inuit throat singing. Um, and we had, you know, had a lot of conversations among Roomful of Teeth 10 years ago when we were building this piece um, uh, with our, our friends Edie and Nakadisi about, about this. But the conversation has changed in the last 10 years, and I want to respect that and um, respect the practitioners of this tradition. So there, we, we actually haven't performed the piece in a year and a half, um, partially because of COVID, but also because we, we want to deeply understand the changes that need to be made and why. And um, so it's, it's very clear to me that um, moving forward, we, we just have a deeper conversation about it. Uh, I think that the next performance of it is not until next fall. So the changes haven't been solidified yet. We actually haven't had a chance to, to be in the same room, um, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's always hard because throughout music history, there's always a, a, a line between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation. And as composers, yeah. we want to be inspired by the outside world, not not just our own small little bubble of it. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's very interesting to deal with those problems, especially um, in this age where, you know, social media brings everyone's opinion to the forefront. Not saying that that's a bad thing or anything, uh, but it's, it's just an important thing that we have to consider now. So thank you for your very honest and, uh, and open answer about that. Our next question comes from William and he asks, are there any playing techniques that you originally used in voice compositions that have cross fertilized, I like that, that uh, soil metaphor there, uh, to string writing or vice versa? 
Oh, with music. I, you know, I used to think about this quite a lot because I, I was mostly a violinist before and then began singing. I, I really love um, the voicings of, I mean, the origin of the string quartet is really sort of in tandem with, with sort of four and five part vocal writing. I love the long sustained lines. I've always tried to play violin like a singer and sing a little bit like a violinist. Um, sometimes they're wildly different. There are things that um, you know I can do on the violin that you, I cannot do with the voice and vice versa. Um, I love the expressiveness of the voice and the connection to language, which you know other instruments don't have, but we can kind of approximate it. And I, I, I love thinking of you know certain analogs like the consonants that we speak and the articulations of the bow on the violin. That's one one that I sort of I like to dip into. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I love that. And you were also talking about in one of our classes, um, just a more general idea of your music. Often there's a sense of chaos for a while, like I think in the partita where, especially in the, in the Pasacalia, where everyone's speaking and then it sort of clears out and then they're speaking again and then it turns into something gorgeous. And that seems to follow in Entrock too. There's this, there's these moments of chaos that just, just come back to calmness. So maybe perhaps not techniques, vocal techniques per se, but uh, something that sort of cross fertilizes within your music. Uh, this, this is sort of a wordy question, but it comes from one of our students, Wade. Uh, he was in, with the uh, meeting with you um, with the Rhodes Singers, uh, and he asked, one of the things you talked about was this moving from the vocal fry to the major chord in Partita. Um, and he says he also noticed that in uh, the last song that we heard as well. And so he wants to know... Um, how are, what is the inspiration of these moving organically between the chords and this vocal fry? What is the inspiration behind utilizing these in-between spaces in your music? And I love that idea, these in-between mm. spaces. <laughs> oh, you know, I've never, I've never thought about it in those terms, but I really like that. Yeah, I like the, the concept of in-between spaces. I think that's, you know, there's a lot of in-between spaces in our lives in many different, different ways. Um, I I just I love this connection. I love a chaos going into order. It's just like a thing that mm -hmm, as you mentioned mm -hmm. is kind of constantly happening. Um, and and I, I tell the story of the very very first part of Partita that I wrote is just the section towards the end of Pasacalia where you just go from uh, um, up into a into a chord, which feels very. It's just playful and child like we all did this as a kid you kind mm -hmm. of like play with your voice that way and um i love things that just transform into other things mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah awesome awesome uh we have a question for one of our uh, professors uh in the art department carl erickson he asks uh to return to the idea of gardening in a way what is the role of chaos and structure in your work how do you incorporate chance weeds and volunteers into your work i love that volunteers oh, yeah, yeah. Volunteer i don't know quite what ones. he means with that by that but yeah uh, um so you're a, a real a real gardener um <laughs> yeah i i you know i've right now i think of often i i start with like on track is a good case of this you know something that's familiar and known like these certain chords and then smudging them a little bit and kind of erasing them um and then sometimes i start from the opposite, sort of something that is is already smudged and broken and fragmented and erased, and then it kind of reforms or congeals into something something else. Um, I guess that's one of the things I love about you know thinking about soil and compost and all the things that have gone in there and decomposed over various scales of time, um, congealing, you know, or, or the seed can sort of congealing into this other plant that grows up. I mean, this is. It, it's springtime now, so I'm just mm -hmm. noticing everything, and I'm I'm wanting to get back home so I can plant my seeds. Mm. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's just a a rich and delightful metaphor that I I keep returning to. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so we're probably going to take probably two more questions. So this one comes from an anonymous attendee, but they ask, um, in your future works, could you envision yourself collaborating with movement artists, dancers, and or choreographers? And you did talk a little bit about your work with, with dance and choreographers in your lecture. Yeah, I've... I've so any um, other future plans? Mm -hmm. Future plans. There's always some future plans. <laughs> <laughs> future plans. Um, the future. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I think in my... I, I really wrote Partita because I... I well, I would love to be a choreographer, a filmmaker, but I'll never mm -hmm. be that. But I, music is my medium, so I was mm -hmm. like, well, if I, how can I make a 
this weird dance of foreground and background and dynamic movement and stillness in music if I can't do it with dance. I'm also a terrible dancer myself. <laughs> um, uh, you know, that's, I, there will always, I'm, I look forward to whatever happens. Next. I'm trying to think if there's anything I can share that I'm working on now. There's a wonderful choreographer who's based in Canada, Helen Simono, who I'm working with at the moment. Um, really developing the music and dance side by side. And I was, I, I really encourage, uh, you know, all young uh, composers, producers to, to find your friends here. I mean, this is a good, it's like, find your friends here at college. There's people all around you who might want to make something so like films and, um, you know, find the collaborators that, that you want to learn from and, and work with and grow with. Awesome, awesome. So our last question comes from Elijah. Uh, and El by the way, Elijah did some amazing uh, video, uh, video work uh, on our first piece, the Will There Be Any Sound Crowns in My, uh, sorry, Will There Be Any Stars in My Crown? Uh, wonderful work by Elijah, a student here at Rhodes. And his he has a big question. Uh, the big question that everyone's thinking about today, especially um, after COVID and how we get back to normal and what will the music landscape look like afterwards. So he asks, in what ways do you expect the music industry to transform over the next decade? Wow, Elijah, <laughs> um, you know, you you may be the one who has the, the answer to that question. I certainly do not. Um, I know that we're all, um, you know, excited to come back together and experience music together in the room. That's one of the things that I think about as a as a composer, as opposed to some of my work as a producer, which are making music in a laptop, but making music for people to do together in a room. And for me, that's always going to be important. Um, there will always be changes in the music industry that are kind of beyond our control. Um, but I have no idea. Mm. But I, I look forward to seeing you in person again sometime. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thank you so much for sharing your music, your wisdom, and your insight with us over these last couple of days. It's meant so much to our faculty, our students, our staff. Uh, we hope that one day we'll see you here in person in Memphis, uh, share some barbecue with you. Uh, but in the main, meantime, please be well. To our wonderful audience who have joined us today, thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to see you next year for our Springfield Lecture. <laughs>